that says Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. President Barack Obama said Thursday he would make, quote, no apologies for agreeing to a prisoner swap to free Sergeant Bo Bergdahl in exchange for five Guantanamo detainees. I'm never surprised by controversies that are whipped up in Washington, right? That, that's, uh, uh, that's par for the course. Um, but I'll repeat what I said two days ago. We have a basic principle. We do not leave anybody wearing the American uniform behind. Uh, we had a prisoner of war uh, whose health had deteriorated and we were deeply concerned about it, and we saw an opportunity and we seized it. And I make no apologies for that. The rescue of Bergdahl has touched off a political firestorm. On Thursday, administration officials said Bergdahl's life could have been in danger if details of the prisoner swap had been leaked. Bergdahl had been held captive by the Haqqani network for five years. While some in the media have speculated that Bergdahl became sympathetic to his captors, new reports reveal Bergdahl actually escaped from them on at least two occasions, once in the fall of 2011 and again sometime in 2012. According to the Daily Beast, in his first escape, Afghan sources said he avoided capture for three days and two nights before searchers finally found him, exhausted and hiding in a shallow trench he had dug with his own hands and covered with leaves. In another development, The New York Times reveals a classified military report concluded Bo Bergdahl most likely walked away from his army outpost in June 2009 of his own free will, but it stopped short of concluding there is solid evidence he intended to permanently desert. The report also revealed Bergdahl had wandered away from assigned areas while in the army at least twice before prior to the day he was captured, including once in Afghanistan. Well, we're joined right now by Matthew Farwell. He's a journalist and a veteran of the Afghan war who's been following the Bergdahl story for years. He helped the late reporter Michael Hastings write his 2012 Rolling Stone piece headlined, America's Last Prisoner of War. Matthew Farwell came to know Bergdahl's parents after they attended the funeral of his brother, who served in Iraq and Afghanistan and died in an accident in Germany. Matthew Farwell, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So why don't you talk about how you met Bo Bergdahl's parents, Bob and Jenny? Well, I didn't really meet them. I was up giving the eulogy for my brother and looked back in the back of the church and saw two people that I thought I recognized, and it was Bob and Jenny Bergdahl. Because you were from Idaho. Because I was—my parents are from Idaho, and— I had been following the news so closely. What year was this? This was 2010, ma'am, February 3rd. And so how did you then come to know them? After that, I kept in touch with them a little bit because I thought that was a classy gesture. And then Michael and I did the story, and I've stayed in touch. And in terms of uh, the story with Michael, uh, how did you decide to uh, focus on the Bergdahl story and, and begin gathering the information, which is really the definitive work uh, uh, on the, the Bergdahl saga? Well, you know, the FBI actually investigated how that uh, came to be, so I've got to keep some trade secrets on it. But uh, No, I explain for a moment. I mean, this is a side story, but Michael died in a fiery uh, car crash, um, and uh, he had said at the time that he was being investigated by the FBI. Yes, and uh, then a Freedom of Information Act request was done by a great journalist named Jason Shapiro, and it came back, and he sent it up to me, and I saw all the redacted portions and said, holy cow, they're talking about me right here. And so I put through a Privacy Act request, got it back, and sure enough, they were looking into our quote-unquote controversial reporting on the story, which I think is a little unusual that the FBI is reading Rolling Stone on the job, but— I give him credit. So tell us about Bo Bergdahl and what you learned. Well, you know, Bo's an interesting guy, and I'm very conflicted myself about how I feel about him and his case. But he was a young man, uh, homeschooled, grew up in Sun Valley, Idaho, from all accounts very intelligent. Um, he 
did a lot of traveling prior to joining the Army. His parents came from California? Yes, ma'am. They came from California to Sun Valley, uh, I think, the year before his older sister was born. And they stayed there ever since. His dad was the Sun Valley UPS man for 30 years. It's hard to get more American than they are. And, and as your story uh, uh, in Rolling Stone details, early on, uh, he grew dissatisfied with being at home, being homeschooled, and uh, decided he wanted to pursue a life of adventure. Did you talk about that? Right. I mean, you know, it seems he went up and worked as a commercial fisherman in Alaska. He traveled around the States on a motorcycle. You know, just all the sorts of things that uh, young men who are seeking something seem to do. And the French Foreign Legion, too? <laughs> and, yeah, and his father said that he had tried to join the French Foreign Legion and was disqualified Explain for what that, eyesight. Uh, what that is, the French Foreign Legion. The French Foreign Legion is a France's force of essentially foreign mercenaries who can come from any walk of life. A lot of them are hardened criminals or refugees currently from Eastern Europe. And once you join, you acquire a nom de guerre, you know, a fake name that you get for them. Bo was known around town in Haley, Idaho. He worked at uh, Zany's Coffee House. He took up ballet, and many had seen his performances. Yes, ma'am. So how does he end up in the U.S. military? How does he end up in Afghanistan? Well, he didn't just end up in the U.S. military. He ended up in the U.S. Army Parachute Infantry. And so it's, you know, the military, about 90 percent are support personnel, about 10 percent are the actual war fighters and trigger pullers. And so he was in that 10 percent. And it seems he just came back one day and said, hey, Dad, I'm thinking about joining the Army. And as we said in the story, are you thinking about joining the Army, or did you already sign up? And Bo had admitted, well, yeah, I already signed up. And so it's a path, you know, a lot of young men take. I took it, uh, dropped out of the University of Virginia to join the infantry. And aside from that, I don't know. But now your, your article um, paints a, um, a, a not very flattering portrait of the unit uh, that he was assigned to and of the problems he had with the lack of discipline and, and the lack of actual fighting capacity of, of the unit that he was in in, a, in an outpost, really, in Afghanistan. Could you describe some of those problems? Well, you know, it seems from uh, the video that Sean Smith of The Guardian shot after embedding with them for about a month. It seemed to me, as a former infantryman who served in that exact area and knows that ground very, very well, that the unit wasn't operating with the same level of professionalism that's required to stay on your game there and keep your men alive and keep your men, apparently, from walking off. I wanted to turn to Sean Smith's—a um, clip of Sean Smith's first film. He's sure. the Guardian reporter, and he uh, was embedded with Bo's unit. Um, and then, uh, because he had come to know this unit, the Bergdahls uh, said he could come to Idaho, and he did a 12-minute piece about Bob Bergdahl. Right. Um, so, let me go to that piece right now, just a clip of um, Sean Smith. He is talking to not Bo, but it's other soldiers who are talking here. These people just want to be left alone. Yeah, they got dicked with, they got dicked with from the Russians for 17 years, and then now we're here. Yeah. Same thing in Iraq when I was there. These people just want to be left alone. They have their crops. Weddings, stuff like that. That's it, man. I'll gladly leave them alone. A few weeks later, Bo Bergdahl, pictured in this photo, disappeared. The circumstances are unclear. That, a report from The Guardian, from Sean Smith, embedded with Bo Bergdahl's unit. Now, according to your piece, uh, the piece that you wrote with Michael Hastings and Rolling Stone, Matthew, Bo sent a final email to his parents on June 27, three days before he was captured in 2009. He wrote, quote, The future is too good to waste on lies, and life is way too short to care for the damnation of others, as well as to spend it helping fools with their ideas 
ideas that are wrong. I have seen their ideas, and I'm ashamed to even be American. The horror of the self-righteous arrogance that they thrive in, it's all revolting. I'm sorry for everything here. These people need help. Yet what they get is the most conceited country in the world telling them that they're nothing and that they're stupid and that they have no idea how to live. The horror that is America is disgusting. He also saw a U.S. military vehicle uh, roll over a Afghan baby. Matthew Farwell. Well, I mean, I think that pretty much speaks for itself. The guy was clearly not happy where he was, not happy with the people he was serving with. And, you know, that area is a bad, bad area that he walked off from. And it's just difficult for me to comprehend what must have been going through his mind when he made that decision. Because I've been through there, and I was scared out of my mind, you know, walking through that town. And some of the guys that were with, you know, intelligence units always told us, hey, watch yourself when you're in Yayakel. And let's be clear, he had packed up his stuff, sent it to his parents, and left his gun, his body armor, everything um, at the outpost, and then he went and left. Right. From what we've heard, he only took a bottle, a couple bottles of water, um, his, his books, and uh, I'm trying to think what else, a knife and his camera. And some of the reports that came through the WikiLeaks disclosures indicate that that's what the Afghan villagers saw when they saw him, you know, walking by himself. And the Afghan villagers thought that was crazy. You, um, you as you say, you were in the same area of uh, Afghanistan. What is your sense of the level of uh, the kind of disillusionment that Bo Bergdahl expressed here? Uh, how prevalent was that, uh, or is that an isolated situation, or was there a, a sharp degree of disconnect between what the soldiers came there thinking they were going to do versus what they ended up doing? Well, you know, like I've said, the, the area was a very difficult area to operate in. You think it's crushing poverty, zero uh, percent female literacy, literally no toilets in the entire province, uh, except for American toilets. And so a lot of the men in my platoon, I was there two years prior to Bo being there, and a lot of the men in my platoon, myself included, came back with tremendous uh, cases of PTSD from what we were doing there, because it was simply a difficult place to fight a war in. And I think everyone from Alexander the Great up to the Soviets to us have learned that fact the hard way. We're going to break and then come back to this discussion. We're talking with Matthew Farwell. He uh, is a writer for Rolling Stone magazine, an Afghan war veteran, helped the late Michael Heistings write the 2012 article on Sergeant Bo Bergdahl that's become the definitive piece on him, called America's Last Prisoner of War. Stay with us.